Nice mood set right now. We're in a different spot, aren't we? It's, uh, it's, it's something we haven't done before, we'll going to a communal area. Where are we? We're in a podcast studio very close to where we used to live, which is uh, bringing back the memories. We yeah, won't memories talk too are much back. Of, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll bring that up on the Doss and Dee Uncut, but we want to welcome our very special guest, Morgan Owen. Welcome to the Doss and Dee Show. Thank you. The finance queen or what, the mortgage-breaking queen, could we call you that? What, what, we, <laughs> yeah, do you have a nickname for... <laughs> Look, I get called Penny all the time. Yeah. Like all the time. And then they realise they're like, oh, wait, that's not your actual name. I'm like, no, nah, but the brand's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> people get get it confused. So. Well, one of the things we struggle with the most each week when it comes to naming an episode of the mm. – we always struggle to think of, all right, we've, we've got Morgan Owen and then we've got to put something with that. Mm-hmm. That's catchy. So it's something that's catchy. So we'll, I'm sure throughout this interview we'll work that out, I reckon. Well, we won't call her Penny, but um, – <laughs> Morgan, how did we get to where you are now? Because we want to talk about Penny Finance and the incredible business that you've built and are building and all the exciting things that are upcoming. But prior to that, talk to us, maybe wind the clock back maybe three or four years ago because to get to where you are now was quite unique, let's just say. Yeah, for sure. I was actually having this conversation yesterday because I think that, you know, I've had a fair bit of success this year. You know, we've won a couple of awards and and so things are kind of really I suppose outwardly people are looking in and thinking, wow, these, these guys are going really great. And and we are. Like there's no two mm. ways about that. But I also think people are looking at it a little bit like it's an overnight success. <laughs> mm. And it is not. Like it's absolutely not. It's It's been a grind and it's been something I've been working really hard on for, you know, Penny has been the last three years. But prior to that I was still a broker for, you know, four, I think it was four or five years prior so, you know, all of that work that happens behind the scenes and the previous roles that I've had and the previous businesses that I've had all helped build up to this yes. point in time, yeah? So, yeah, I was speaking to someone else who also has a similar thing where they're quite successful now and people kind of look at it and they're like, oh, wow, you know, that? how did you do that in such a short period of time? And this guy is like, mate, this is like 20 years in the making, you know? Yeah. It's only just sort of starting to get lots of traction. But, yeah, there's a lot that happened behind the scenes. So I don't know, how far do you want to go back? Well, well, I wanted to ask, did you always want to be a broker? Like, like was, is that how it started? And then did you, all, from becoming that, did you then go, I want my own business? Like, how did it kind of come about? Not at all. Nah. You know, go back to school. I grew up in a country town. Mortgage broking was not a thing. Okay. You know, I, I don't even know if that's a small country town thing, but, you know, back, back when we were at school, I don't know if mortgage broking was really all that popular. So, no, growing up, I had the option of like I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor or a, probably a lawyer. I didn't like reading all that much. And so the next option was probably like a school teacher or a nurse and none of that resonated with me. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I actually studied nutrition. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Undergrad wise nutrition, which seems left of field now, but at the time was pretty relevant to me. Did my undergrad and was all right, but yeah, still wasn't really like hitting – I, it, it, it didn't feel like what I was supposed to be doing sure. with my life. But what I really wanted to do then was buy a house. That's all I could focus on. I was so desperate for security and, you know, having a house where my parents had, you know, separated when I was young and I spent so much of my time living out of a, you know, bag and not having a wardrobe where you could put stuff in. So I was so desperate to want to buy a house. So then I started work and it was through working I actually went into the fitness industry realized I was really good at sales and influencing and business. And so then I transitioned going down the business route, but still I hadn't found finance. Like that wasn't until a couple of years later where I was doing my MBA and I had some really great mentors at that time that were trying to help me sort of figure out where my life was going to yeah. go. <laughs> I was very fortunate to have people around me that cared about me. And yeah, they were the ones that kind of said, Morgan, we think finance is kind of a good option for you. And I was like, wow, that's random, but Sure, let's give it a crack. I've always been a bit of a say yes, worry about the details later mm. type person. Yeah. Can I quickly ask? Yeah. Were you a good saver growing up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Do you guys have you know in your friendship groups? Do you have someone who you kind of look to that you would ask questions about, like how did you do that or how are you saving? And I just I was that person for mm. some reason I was that kind of person that people were always asking advice of when it came to money and property so yeah it was a natural yeah. affinity and I did buy my first house really young too so yeah property wasn't random like that's where things started to sort of make started to make more sense so how old were you when you bought your first house 22 pretty wow. young yeah wow. so then how did it then how did you even go into then mortgage broking for say that next step from there and to then bring that you know, creating your own business, mm -hmm. 
fill in the gaps there. Fill in the gaps. So all the way back then I was working in fitness. I was actually working for a Pilates franchise. Okay. Took annual leave, did my mortgage broking course, which I'll have you know is not very hard. <laughs> yeah, you told us over yeah. coffee the other day. We nearly we nearly spat it back out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, no, the cert for in finance and mortgage broking is not very difficult. It doesn't take that long. So I managed to get that done pretty quickly. Resigned and started working in finance. And I was working at that time. I went in, I needed a salary. You know, I had a mortgage. I I, I, I was brand new to the industry. I, I definitely didn't think I had what it took to just go out and start a mortgage broking business like at all. Mm. So I very much wanted to work somewhere where I could learn, you know, learn from people who were doing it, were doing it really well. Um, and so I worked uh, for a, essentially for a firm who had their own product. So they, it's called a white label product, you know, they were a mortgage management. And I didn't really even understand what that meant yeah. <laughs> at the time. I was kind of like, oh yeah, that sounds good. You know, you got your own product. How awesome is that? And, you know, that's what they wanted us to sell essentially, okay. which, you know, for them, that's where they made their money. Um, but as a mortgage broker, you're supposed to want to find the best option for the client. Yeah. And so then I started looking at all these other options and it was always a bit contentious because they didn't particularly want me to be looking at all the other options. They just wanted me to be looking at their options. Sure. So there was a bit of a, a bit of a values disconnect, I'd probably say there. And so then I started looking at other opportunities which is where I actually started another business. So I went into partnership with um, a couple of other people. Uh, that unfortunately didn't go great. I mean, it, go, it went great to begin with, um, but then it didn't go so great and I actually lost that business, got taken away yeah. from me, <laughs> uh, at which point then I started Penny. Yeah. Well, I guess on that front, did, were you scared to get back into business after losing a business? Like before starting Penny, mm. you must, you're in the trenches, mm. you're absolutely gutted. Mm. Do you kind of lose a bit of motivation or that does, to drive, desire, whatever the right word is to maybe go, oh, geez, is this actually meant for me? Yeah, look, probably no. I, at that time, you know, because I'd been a broker for a few years at that point, I had a lot of people counting on me. You know, what we do is is important. What we do changes people's lives. What we do helps people go move into their, their brand new homes or buy their investment properties. We're dealing with people's money. Mm. So I had this pipeline of clients that needed my help. I had this these in-flight applications that all of a sudden now I couldn't write. I couldn't even access. I, could, I lost everything at that point. And so my phone started ringing and Morgan, why are your emails bouncing and what's going on? And I was like, okay. I'm, I'm just going to figure this out. That's a hard position <laughs> to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. It was It was really hard. And at that same time, just to really like put another nail in the coffin, I was also getting divorced. Mm-hmm. So that time of my life was absolute categorical chaos. And third prong to that was it was the start of 2020. Yeah. yeah. So Everyone's we all know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all know what was going on at that point in time as well. So was I demotivated? Uh, that's that's probably not how I would describe it. I I was very cut, obviously. You know, I, I spent a lot of time just pretty much in shock. But I also I think that what got me through and was the clients. It was like, well, I've got to help them. They're, these are my people. These are my clients. I've worked so hard for this. I'm not just going to let it go. Um, and it was actually Ben, you know, Ben who's helped us obviously get this room and everything yeah, today. Big and, shout and out to ben. Oh, shout yeah, out. big shout out. Yeah, big <laughs> shout out to Ben um, was critical for me at that point in time. You know, he's the one that sat on the phone with me when we were trying to figure out what I was going to call it and, um, you know, he's, he's been a wonderful support for me all the way back from when I even started broking, you know. So I've got I've got a few people that have, have always remained in my corner and I will be forever grateful to that. But, yeah, I'm not going to say that like I'm, I'm maybe sugarcoating it a little bit, right, like I, I spent – an enormous amount of time, very upset and in the fetal position and wondering if I could do it, of course. But, you know, I don't think that starting a business is supposed to be easy. Well, certainly not. Especially going through a divorce as well. Well, <laughs> that's another thing which we might tap into a little bit later. But I'm interested, you mentioned like the business being taken away from you. How Was this like an overnight thing where suddenly, maybe talk to us a little bit more, you said like suddenly your emails are bouncing, people mm. can't get on top of you, mm. your clients, I don't know if they're just taken away from you, I don't know what the other side of the partnership does. Yeah, maybe explain in more detail if you can Mm. about what that actually means when it's taken away from you. Yeah, so 
in a partnership, there's essentially shares in a business, right? So you guys, I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing. We're a partnership, yeah, yeah, there you go. You have a partnership. You have maybe probably equal partnership. Mm-hmm. You're both contributing to the business. You both have your various skill sets and, you know, that's just, that's the way that it works. So in my case, there was three, three partners and we're equal shares in that business. And one of the parties, we were, two of us were moving away from the third partner, which was fine and that was all, you know, very much in agreement. But... Um, during that process, it was asked of me to sign over my shares to the other person that I was moving away with um, because that would have made the negotiation easier because that would have given them majority shareholding. So I was like, yeah, cool, no worries. Like, just So they're getting 100% at this stage? No, it wasn't what? 100%, but, but the, them and my share together was okay. more than the I see, other I person. See, I see. Yeah, because when it's three people, yeah. as soon as you get two on the same team, <laughs> yeah, okay. that outvotes the, yeah. the third person. So, you know, without getting too nitty gritty, sure. it essentially gave them more power in the negotiation, right? So I was like, mm-hmm. cool. Because for me, I was just, we were just working, we were grinding, we were still getting new clients. We'd, we'd set up a whole new entity to, to keep trading out of. So for me, I was just looking at it like it was play on, like this yeah. is what we need to do to get it done. If it's going to make it happen faster, like cool. Like I, I don't like being in limbo. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm just the sort of person that's, I'm always like, what's next? What's next? What's next? How do we get them um, solution focused? So to me, it didn't even cross my mind that that was going to end up being my, <laughs> being a really shitty idea. And uh, yeah, so I did that again without thinking twice about it and then months are going by and COVID hits and communication is really lacking and, you know, there's just all this back and forth and back and forth and really nothing kind of going on and and then it got to a point where the the, the brands essentially did move into the new entity but I had no leg to stand on because I'd signed over all my shares and so I was supposed to then get the, the shares in the new entity once it was all set up but they decided that that wasn't the way it was going to be. It's crazy. Unbelievable. Like, yeah. It just doesn't sound real, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, it's not ethical, like, for one. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but then what, what was the time frame between then and getting back on your feet to creating Penny? Pretty immediately. Really? Yeah. 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 Like I was, I was upset but I was pissed. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, equal, equal parts, yeah, yeah? equal parts. Um, yeah, I, I had to because I had to survive, guys. This is the other thing. Like where does the money come from? Mm. Like – genuinely, where does the money come from? And you got a mortgage? Well, I didn't. Oh, no, okay. So part of the divorce, all of that okay. had also been obliterated. Yep. But, yeah, so I'm getting divorced. I've, I've, I'm literally down to bare bones at this point. Um, we, I did have an income from the other business, but we'd also talked about the fact that, you know, going out on our own and moving away from that initial partner was going to mean for both of us just going back to bare bones and stripping out those salaries and making sure that, you know, we could get the business up and sustainable and then we go back to sort of paying each other and, you know, you know from the business. And that's just how it works. You know, you've got to go back to creating a sustainable business and then you kind of worry about your income later. So I was more than willing to do that. So look, anyway, it got to the point where I had nothing though. Absolutely, categorically nothing, and no access to anything because again, I had no leg to stand on. I had no shares in the business. I had I had nothing. So my email got shut down. So then that's why the email started bouncing. But my, I had my phone, and that was literally, literally the only thing I had. So yeah, my clients were calling me and wondering what had happened, and I was like, okay, just it's okay. We'll we'll figure this out. Um, and that's what I had to do. Can you tell the like the truth in those scenarios to your clients, or are you under some kind of legal threat or confidentiality yeah about it's, what's... it's really it's really challenging because because yeah. previously I was em- employed by the entity that I was part owner sure. in right and so then as an employee you do you have all of these obligations around you know who the who owns the clients and all that sort of stuff so yeah it got really messy because ultimately I was the broker like that was my business that I'd created from scratch with all my you know previous knowledge and previous relationships and everything like that that I'd sort of brought to the table so, you know, the clients, it didn't, for, for the client, it didn't really matter where I was because they cared about Morgan, you know, and that's mm. what they, so at that time, I, yeah, I, I realistically, I couldn't contact anyone because un- legal, like from a legal obligation point, yeah, that, that was definitely something that I couldn't do. But I was fortunate that people found me, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and no one can stop anyone from working with who they want. So that, that's where we sort of had to move forward in, in that way. So that's what I did. So people would contact me and they were wondering what was going on. And, you know, so I was being very sort of coy and just mm-hmm. being like, look, you know, it hasn't necessarily gone according to plan, but I'm setting up a new business, you know, and everything's sort of going to keep moving. But 
Yeah, fuck. It was fucking wow. hard, man. <laughs> I look at what you created and like being able to catch up with the other day and have a clear understanding of like the rapid growth and the way it's happened. There's got to be something inside of you that like, I'd love to know like who mo- – like if you have certain inspirations or if you have certain people in your life, you don't just like have this – like people just don't have it. Like mm. you got to f- someone. You typically you find it from something or someone or like why? What's this burning entrepreneurship? Like that's mm. a real key factor, and mm. you got to want it and do it. Like what? What's yours? It's a really great question. Um, I'm ultra resilient, and you know if I look back at my life and events that have happened in my life, like I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm, I'm, I grew up in a really awful situation. I didn't. My parents are very middle class. They worked very hard. We didn't have to necessarily want for anything. They, they got divorced and that was really hard. And, you know, that played its role with, you know, everything that happened you know, in that time. You know, if you guys have, you've got a, you, your parents are separated too. Like mm-hmm. you just know that that sort of, you know, that sort of trauma that you have, even if they, they're actually okay, you know, that, that does live with you. So, but even going back further than that, like I had a couple of really, awful things happened when I was, when I was a kid, my, um, my first boyfriend, actually, <laughs> um, he, this is, you know, going back to like year seven, year eight, um, you know, your first love, you're spending all your time together. He got shot and killed. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh. By one of our other friends by accident. <sighs> yeah. And there's been like, that's obviously like horrific, you know, and I, if you guys, and, and I encourage everyone to do this, like you reflect back on times in your life where something's gone really, really fucking wrong, think about your response in that moment, right? And because what happens is your body goes into this fight flight response. It has to because your, your, your being wants to survive in those moments. So it has to figure out how to do that. And so I think that, that something happened to me at that point, and it could have even been before that, I'm not really sure, but that's just such a really critical point in my history that I look back at that and I, I had to figure out, fuck, how do I just survive? And what really worse can kind of happen at yeah. that point? <laughs> not There's not really totally. a lot that, that can be a heck of a lot worse in that situation. So I think for me it's always been like, fuck, I dealt with that. Like I can deal with this shit, you know, mm. and I'm just going to figure out how to move forward. You know, again, be, I'm very solution focused. I try not to get really bogged down in things. And it, it's not to say that that does, it doesn't affect me. It absolutely does. But I just figure out a way to move forward and I try to do it as quickly as I can. It's incredible. And we will talk shortly about money and, and for the <laughs> listeners. So t- that we'll give some <laughs> well, tips. Who knows? We'll, we might not. Well, who knows? Honestly. I, I was about to say I'm really, oh, really. This is actually really good. It's yeah. really, really intriguing because we'll we were speaking over coffee the other day and you're talking about the empire that you are currently building and the rapid growth and everything that you've got in place. And we kind of looked at each other and said, gee, Morgan's like, even beyond Penny Finance will become an unbelievable business coach, consultant, whatever you want to call it. But Penny Finance itself, what stands it out against the rest? Because there are a lot of mortgage brokers. There's young mortgage brokers, there's older mortgage brokers, there's men, there's women, there's, there's heaps of them now. But why does Penny Finance stand out so far and clear above everybody else in your eyes? In my eyes, I was going to say. Because <laughs> yeah. where, where are we getting that in, feedback in your- from? <laughs> Well, well, I'll, your opinion. In, my, so in our opinion, well, it's pretty clear, and we've said this to you. Firstly, in this day and age, we look at your social media, and it's so far ahead of most. I mean, firstly, it's engaging, and it captures people's attention very quickly, and it's clean, and it looks good, and you're the face of it, and we get to see you and behind the scenes. So that's already a big portion of it. But the back end of the business that we don't see from the front, what do you think makes it so successful? Oh, thank you for that. Well, I think what I what I put out online is a really critical part of that. Okay. So when I started mortgage broking, I really wanted to focus on people like me. Okay. So when I bought my first house, it was really hard and I didn't have any idea what I was fucking doing, like zero clue. And my personality was, ah, it doesn't matter. We'll work it out. It'll figure itself out. Like I just want to buy a house. Like what's the worst that can happen. Right. So I just, you know, I I just trusted the process and I just went through it and it was what it was, but I did not have anyone going into any sort of detail with me on how it worked and what I should look out for and take me on that journey and hold my hand. I definitely didn't have that. So I wanted to be that. But when I started broking, all the feedback I kept getting from everyone around me was don't waste your time with young people. They don't have any money. The loan amounts are too small. They, you know, they're going to, it's going to take them too long to save for a deposit. But I just looked at that and I was like, but this is the next generation of buyers. Like if, if okay, fair enough, if they're not ready now, but they will be. 
And if I can be the person to help them get to the point of being ready and add that value and educate them and empower them and maybe even get them there sooner, who do you think they're going to come to as their mortgage broker? Who do you think they're going to talk to their friends about? Who do you think they're maybe even going to talk to their parents or their, you know? Exactly. And that's what I wanted to be. And so I just, I saw that gap because no one else, want, no one else cared about them. Everyone else was like, nah, too young, too much hard work. Like first home buyers, like, yeah, yeah, don't want to deal with that. So that's, that was the first thing. I just, just I probably didn't look at the bottom line. <laughs> you know, I yeah. probably just looked at who I actually wanted to service, who I actually wanted to help. So that was a big one. Women was a big one. I wanted to help women understand that they didn't need somebody else. Like mm. I bought my first house on my own um, without a partner. That is my dad though was critical in helping from a guarantor point of view. So I'm always really open about saying that people get a leg up and that's okay too. Let's just figure out whatever's going to be the best way for you to make it happen and it's your specific circumstance and stop comparing you to everybody else because it's not the same thing. So that that's kind of where it all started. But then where it's morphed to is I don't focus on the transaction. So if you come to me to buy your first house or you want to invest in property in general, that's not all I'm talking to you about. I want to know what your budget looks like and how your cash flow is going and what your dreams and your aspirations are if, you know, you want to get into business. If you, mm -hmm. I'm always helping you think through what's next because I see your potential. That's something that I do. Like it's just inherent within me. I look at people and I can see all these opportunities that maybe you can't even see yet. And so I want to help guide you into getting there. So it's not just about a house to me. I can feel you looking into our eyes. So <laughs> you know, it's, it feels great. <laughs> no, that, yeah. So I think that that's why it's different because to me it's not just about how many loans can I pump through. It's how many loans could we potentially get for you over your life that's good, that we can leverage and, and build right. your wealth, you know. So going deep rather than going wide necessarily on that then because typically uh, we, we it's talked about you know what, what, what's the american dream so it's the buy a house but it's probably similar in australia people probably just think of buying one house and that's probably all they think about is part of the process expanding their imagine imagination or thought process around that like you've got the first one like you know start thinking elsewhere 100 percent. yeah a hundred percent. And it, like take a first home buyer as an example. You know, if someone comes to me and they, they really want to stretch, put all their eggs, eggs in that one first home buying basket and, and not have any sort of servicing capacity to save anything, invest anything. That's something I'm talking to them about being not a great idea. Like, you know, just putting all their eggs in that, not having any surplus, like that's going to be stressful. Mm. So I'm, I'm helping them sort of think through how their decisions will impact other things within their life, right? And and fair enough, like at, at one point that might be the focus, which is fine, but I'm still then going to be checking in with you in a year or two or three or whatever that will look like and working on what's going to be next. Because the cool thing about property, if you do it right, it's going to grow. And so when it grows, it there's equity available. And when you have equity available, you should be leveraging that. You shouldn't just be letting it lie dormant, especially young people. There's so much power in being able to use that and go again and again and again. And whether it's property over and over again, the other option is that we can go down other investment routes too, which is then when I'd introduce them to people like Ben, who's the financial advisor who can be talking to them about all these other options too. So again, Yes, I'm in property and, and obviously I get paid by the bank when, when we write loans, but I care more about you getting the best outcome. So if that's not property or property isn't necessarily what you care all that much about, then there's other options too. But I'm not going to realistically just let you not do anything. I mean, <laughs> you, of course, it's your money. It's up to you, but I want you to know what your options are. And that's what I like to tell people. Like you'll walk away this knowing all your options and then we get to decide. But I would hate for you to just do the thing because you, that's what you came to me for. Meanwhile, I knew that there was four or five or six other things you could have done and I didn't even tell you. Sure. Has there ever been an instance or what would happen in this hypothetical if somebody came to you and they're clearly not in a position or you look at them and go, this is not, actually not a good idea, what advice do you then give to get out of potentially that hole to then take the next step in property? Great, great question. So that's why I created a couple of strategy sessions that I have. So I have what's called the penny purchase plan. So that's for people who know they want to get into property at some point, but they just need help navigating their budget, saving the money, getting the deposit together. But 
these people need to know what the end goal is, okay? So, okay, fair enough, Morgan, if I can save 30 grand, does that mean I can get into my first house and what can that look like? And I'll walk them through to that end point where it's like not only do you need to save more because anyone can tell you that. Mm. Anyone can, and that's what another mortgage broker would likely do. Tell you just go away and save more, come back to me when you have a bigger deposit. But you walk away and you're like, Cool. How do I do that? How do I do that? Like, yeah. yeah. How do I do that? What am I aiming for? And you haven't changed any habits. So you are very unlikely to get there too. You'll mm. just keep spinning the wheels and just keep doing everything like you were before. So I created a plan to show you how to essentially rejig your cash flow, save more, spend better. And it's not for me to sit there and judge on how you are spending your money, but it is for me to be like essentially highlight where the money's going, make sure that's in line with your values and that you're happy with that. And then it's play on. We, we figure out how to how long it's going to take you to save for a deposit. That's six months, cool. If it's 12 months, it's two years, whatever. I'm there and we're going to cheat you on the whole way. Yeah. So that's a penny purchase plan. The other one is we have a um, penny power as well. So that's for people kind of really struggling, you know, where they might have a heap of debt at the moment, you know, personal debt, credit cards, personal loans, that sort of stuff. And they're really, they even need to get to ground zero before they can even start saving. You know, they need to get on top of all of their their debts. Um, and so that's another thing that we can help with as well. Yeah, so, cool. yeah, I, these are the things I, I created these strategy sessions in and around that because I wanted to be able to give people something, you know, and I didn't have to just send you off into the distance and hope that you got it right because you won't. <laughs> like yeah. it's, a, it's a really, really good chance you won't and you'll just keep making the same mm. mistakes. What is your opinion on credit cards? I'd love to know. Look, that depends on you. So, yeah. oh, that was like such, it, a, such yeah. a perfect answer. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. So, so that depends on you, Doss. Yeah. <laughs> well, Doss, for you as a business owner, yeah, a business has a, a fair bit of expenses, right? That are just inevitable, and so it can make sense for business owners to have a, a business credit card where you you cover all of your expenses off with the credit card, and then you you know you pay it off at the end of the month, say, and you maybe you accrue the points like the Qantas points and there's, and there's a bonus there but what you're what is what you're not doing is spending money that you wouldn't otherwise spend like you were going to spend that money anyway you may as well spend it on the credit card and then pay it back off out of your account like that that's a, that's a way that it can be super viable and you can build up your points and, and use purely them. just for the points purely just for the points yeah yeah right Conversely, if you're a young person and you just have a bad spending habit and you want to be able to spend money you don't have and then you're going to get yourself into credit card debt that you then can't pay back, no, it's a no. It's an absolute no for me. Even if you were getting points, it's not worth it because of the interest that you're paying and the debt you're getting yourself into. So pretty much if I come across young people with credit cards, they're not managing them well. Like I'm, I, I don't see many young people managing debt, like credit cards, personal loans. It hasn't come from anything other than overspending, yeah. realistically. So there is a place for it. You know, down the track, you've got, you've got a home loan and, and again, you know, expenses that you would, you would have to spend anyway. People will leave their money in either their offset or they read your account so it's offsetting the interest on their home loan, use the credit card, pay the credit card off. And again, if you're managing that super well, cool. But for the most part, if you've got a credit card, you're actually spending more than you would otherwise because mm. it feels different. Like a credit card, you tap you tap, you tap the credit card away. It doesn't feel like real money almost. I've never felt it. Uh, I don't, don't I've have never one? had one. I've never no, had one yeah, either. We, okay. don't have a, we don't have a business one. Maybe we should for, no. the, uh, for, the, <laughs> flight, for the flight Morgan points. Morgan said no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah no. I, I'd be interested to know, Morgan, mm. um, this is a tough question probably to answer because – it's a hypothetical, but in terms of a lot of people that might be in their mid to late twenties, how many do you think would be sitting on potentially following you on Instagram? They'd be too afraid to even reach out for that initial chat because they don't believe they're in a position to do something. But realistically, if you had a look, they might be. Oh, I, I literally recorded a story on that this morning. Oh, really? Probably get posted like in two days time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So my whole thing is don't assume if you have, a stable job, okay, if you have stable income and you're saving money or you're paying rent or both, you will be in a position at some point in the near future to be able to buy a house. Okay. Okay. What you need to, to get into property, it's two main hurdles you've got to get over. The first one is we've got to save a deposit. If you don't have that now, it's okay. We can work towards getting you to a point where you have that money saved. Roughly and how much is it percentage-wise is there a number? Yeah, yeah. As a first home buyer, there's schemes right now where you can get in with as little as 5%. Wow. The the smallest deposit I've ever helped someone buy their first home, I helped a girl last year. She bought a, a, a one-bedroom unit. I think it was, you know, somewhere around Kingsville, like, you know, West. She had 18 grand as a deposit. Wow. 
On our own. On our own. Yeah, wow. Yeah. You know, but then conversely, I've got clients spending, you know, two million bucks on their first time. Lucky yeah. them, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's 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 chalk and cheese. Like it's sure. but the with those schemes, the five percent schemes, there's just some caveats around that. You've got to be earning as a combined, if it's a couple under two hundred thousand, if it's a single, I think it's hundred and twenty five. Um Five percent, but it's capped out. So different states have different price caps. Melbourne's eight hundred, as an example. So you know, as long as you meet the eligibility, it's. And this is what I say all the time: it could be a lot easier than you think. Yes, like mm. just reach out if property is in your realm. If you want to be able to figure out how to make it happen, let's just create a plan. Mm. Like, don't just keep sitting procrastinating about it because the more time you wait, guess what happens with property prices? Yeah, they. Just- they- they keep going up. Like we were talking about that, weren't we? Like yeah, earlier, yeah. You, where you guys grew up in, you know, down the coast, you, there was all these places that were like, you know. Shacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then now they're like two million bucks, yeah. you know. Yeah. Property, investing, it's all about time in the market. So the quicker you can get in and you hold it long term, like that's what's going to create wealth in the long run. So the, the longer you wait, you're just going to keep chasing those property prices. I, I often think from a personal point of view, like myself, it's almost like I'm choosing. I might, I'm choosing to either run and start a business or choosing to buy, get a job and buy a house. So for someone that wants to buy a house, that they might have their own business, and it's in its infancy stage still. It's like they often say a business doesn't often make really really good money until three plus years typically. So say they've they're up to that three year mark and it's getting there, but it's still base model wage. How does someone like us? Um, how does someone, <laughs> this sounds very familiar. Um, how, how does someone like save for a house? Because I look at me and my partner Garni. She's got her business. We've got our business. But you also want to do it the right way. Yeah. No. And and look, I get that. It is different mm. as a business owner and working POYG. So that's why I said to you before: stable job, stable income. It's it is like tick like that's just ticking a box like it is easy I'm no two ways about that but I'm also very entrepreneurial right so I also get it from the other perspective so for me personally after the divorce everything that's happened right now I'm focused on the business so for me my long term prosperity is going to come from building this out yes and then as you know my it gets to a point where I'm paying myself the income and you can grow your personal wealth outside of that that's fine but I'm personally putting that on pause right now so that I can personally focus on the business but for you guys so you're in a partnership do you pay yourselves an income from the business yes yeah so you pay so you get your pay slips you pay yourself a wage Mm -hmm. yeah so in theory as long as you've been doing that for six months and we can show six months of those pay slips and those salary credits that's you get treated as if you were payg interesting okay yeah yeah so So you've got the three years because we're talking about changing the business from a partnership into more of a like our accountant was talking to us about moving it into I can't remember if you say corporation or a company or something like that. Mm-hmm. Does that make much difference? Or? Um, I, think, I, think I think we should be paying for this call yeah. 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 for this conversation. Yeah. So maybe no, we no, 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 the, no. the listeners, the listeners no. are not interested in no. this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a D, just some personal business <laughs> coaching here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, scrap that. We'll talk to you off air. We'll okay, I'll answer your question. Because I'll answer your question only in the way that I'm allowed to answer that question sure. because I'm actually non accountant So I can't give you structural advice on how to set up your business. But from a lending point of view, mm. if you guys change from a partnership to a corporation, let's say, you know, in a, in a similar way that if you were both independently sole traders and then you, you created an entity together, as long as it's still just the two of you, there's no essentially ownership change it's just like an entity change and the reason right. it happened was because your accountant said it was a good idea maybe from a tax point of view we can still lend yeah, yeah? Cool. so as long as you guys keep your income steady we would then just have to explain to the lender you know previously it was a partnership now it's a corporation yada yada cool. we'll make a story around that but that's fine we'll, we'll come back to you shortly then <laughs> yeah. when, uh, we talk to you again i was <laughs> going to ask you yourself personally where do your investments tend to lie outside of maybe property? Do you invest outside of property or not? Or And if so, whereabouts? Yeah, so back to what we were saying before, like right now, Penny's getting all my pennies. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am very, very heavily invested in Penny Finance. Um, but previously, yeah, previously, Ben, still here. Ben. Um, yeah, outside of property. We need, we need a Ben camera. Yeah, we, <laughs> well, there was an extra mic there. Maybe we should get Ben on to the last we, um, questions of him. Yeah, outside of property, shares, right? And diversification is key. And I'm not giving financial advice. We're not sitting here doing that. But 
it, yes, it is critical that when it comes to investing, it's an overall strategy. You know, even with property, I've got clients that we're buying properties for, you know, we use the buyer's advocate interstate. You know, if we've got a property in Queensland and we're looking at a property in Perth or we've got a property in, in Victoria, like even that diversification, like around the states can be can be really important too because markets fluctuate and if one's up, one can be mm. down, you know, it's a similar thing with shares. So with shares, you've got to have a financial advisor. Well, I mean, you don't. You can actually invest in shares completely on your own without a financial advisor. You absolutely can do that. I but recommend to the listeners don't do that yeah, because I've, yeah. I've made that mistake a few times. <laughs> oh yeah, e- exactly. It's like, well, are you are you an expert? And and maybe absolutely not. No. <laughs> yeah, probably not advised. <laughs> a big aspect of your business, and Dee mentioned it earlier, is your social media, and you've built um, you know a, a solid audience on there. And and from what we've spoken about, you know, every a lot of your business comes through there, and that's through you being your authentic self and being relatable, obviously. How do you go being yourself on social media? Because I know for a lot of people, it's a hard thing to do. And I guess you could answer it honestly, and I'm sure this is true, but you are yourself on there. You're not trying to be, pretend to be someone else, are you? Absolutely not. No. Yeah. How exhausting would that be? Yeah. A lot of people do it. Yeah, do a they? lot of people do it. What do you like? What? Just put on a, a, a show or a face oh, and pretend oh, to be someone else? Oh, well, we'll pretend to be Carlton supporters this morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'll see that video later. Okay. Um, but. No, I reckon uh, uh, maybe it's probably more of a. Do you mean more like just openly sharing, like yeah, you know, even if it's not perfect yep, type thing? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's taken time though. You know, if I if I look back, I was such a, oh man, I I would agonize over posting a reel. Like ask Axe, like my partner, go back to those first few reels that I when I started posting. Like I would sit there. To like, you know, because I, I wanted to be able to post at like 6 p.m. or something, right? And so then at like 5 p.m. I was like making sure that the caption was perfect and then I, I redid it like 10 times and she's like, just fucking post it. Like yeah. no one cares. I was like, oh, yeah, you're probably right. Like it's probably going to get two views. Like no one, <laughs> literally no one cares. Um, so, yeah, look, it definitely took me time to just chill the fuck out and just do it and 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 be that authentic self and, mm. and not sort of stress too much about the intricacies of it. But yeah, that, that took time to flex that muscle. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Well, and truly now it's a matter of the time. So, you know, making sure that you, you've got enough time and you're putting it all together and, and it is still adding value. I batch create. So like I'll, I'll, you know, we essentially plan out like, you know, a couple of weeks in advance and we're, we're sort of making sure that like we're hitting all of the, the things within that point in time that makes sense you know there's been so much talk around fixed rates and come that coming off and and making sure that we're we're staying topical because I, I need to make sure of that but even in, I, I want to transition so what I hope everyone will start to see soon is it's going to become a little bit less of just me and a lot more of the team as well because the team is growing and we have more than just me now and we have more brokers that are going to be um, helping our clients and so Penny as a as a brand, as a as a company, is going to start showcasing more more of that. So mm. it will it will start to I suppose the next evolution is coming. Yeah, well, that leads perfectly into my next question about the growth of your team. Talk to us about that expansion that's now happening and the, the new mortgage brokers that have come on board and probably the way you're going to mold them into your style. Yeah, yeah, and you know, going back to what's different about Penny, like I'm not interested in growing for the sake of it. Like I'm interested in growing in the exact way that I know I want to be able to service our clients and and really sort of maintaining the essence of what Penny is about is so important to me. So I'm being really hectic on the recruitment process, um, which, you know, one of my, my most newest recruit, Imogen, her name is, so she's a broker that's going to be starting in a couple of weeks. Um, I put her through the ringer. I did <laughs> because I've, I've made mistakes in, in the past with, again, like, you know, clearly I've made a big mistake in the past with with trusting people. So I've had to get really good at that. So I have I've got a much more rigorous recruitment process now that I'm taking everyone through. Um, and then they'll spend a lot of time shadowing me. Um, and that's not to say that I need everyone to be me. I don't want that. I want them to be their authentic self. But Penny has a process and, you know, Penny has a way of doing things. So we just need to be making sure that that's getting captured. Now, what's been the most frustrating part about having an office with a bunch of staff? Underneath you, I'm sure there's got to be, because mm-hmm. I, I think of, um, I often think of my dad having his business and, um, you know, and we were working from home and there was always challenges with staff working from our house, like in the office, but there was also so many good things about that. But I'm sure that you right now, like 
I think you told us the other day, you're, you're working, the, the office is like tiny, tiny it's, yeah. you know, and the team's just yeah. growing rapidly. Like mm-hmm. how are you going with those challenges? I'm getting a new office. Yeah. Well, good <laughs> mu- mu- must be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we are. We're, we're expanding. So my office at the moment sits at the back of our personal training studio. Zach and I have a PT studio at the front and then we just have this essentially this room. Guys, not even kidding. It's about the size of this room. Wow. Yeah, that we're in right now. So to give everyone context, it's about like a six by four and in there I have six desks, which is – Okay, like I hope no one like oh, health, health and safety, none of that. Like <laughs> we're fire hazard, like no one come and get me. Like it's probably not ideal. So, yeah, but I, I didn't expect to grow this quick, you know. Yeah. When I started, you know, started 2020 and, you know, obviously I wanted to grow but, yeah, it literally got to the point where I was like, I don't have any more desks. What now? So, yeah, we're moving down the road not too far. But, in, I mean, in terms of challenges – Oh, There's look, a lot of toilet the, paper to go through. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know, had to get a subscription to get the cupboards that. full all the time, lots of tea bags there. Yeah, yeah. coffee, yeah. oat milk. Got a coffee almond machine? Almond milk. Oh, yes. yes. All the types all of All the milk. different types of yeah. milk. Got it. Now, pretty much everyone's on oat now. Yeah. yeah. I see. It's where it's at. Yeah, oat milk. But the, but the, but the nice one. Hey, you didn't. I thought I did. Yeah. <laughs> the Khalifa one, the nice one. But the biggest challenge, you know, take the staff out of it. Well, I mean, they're in it, but the biggest issue that small businesses have is cash flow Mm. you know and I'm in finance and you know I get debt for a living but the biggest issue you have is cash flow and when you're trying to scale that happens on steroids (laughs) you know because you're trying to add more resources to be able to grow but there's always a lag you know because you add in a resource but then you need that resource to scale up and actually be able to start producing. And there's some time there where the business and the company is actually outweigh, outlaying the cost to, to essentially pay for that team member before they realistically start making the business any kind of money. So it's yeah. it's a little terrifying. But going back to my personality, being say yes and worry about the details later. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a good way to be. At. I'm interested. I'm just backpedaling a little bit, but I'm really interested. You mentioned you put people through the ringer or you put your current staff through the ringer before – them actually coming on board. What does that actually mean? What does Mm. that entail? Yeah. So I have my team actually meet the candidate first. Okay. So, you know, in saying that. Wow. It's like a a Pokemon gym. You've got to work your way out to the boss. Yeah, literally. (laughs) Because I want a vibe check. Yeah. You know, I want a vibe check. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Like you have, it has to, it has to be a fit. Yeah. You know, Penny, again, we just have a certain way of, of being and operating. And when you when you work with people, you, you guys know this, you spend a lot of time together. So, like, it, there needs to be a, a synergy there. So, first of all, we get a vibe check. We make sure that it's a, it's it's on. Then from there, yeah, we'll, I'll obviously sit down with them and we'll make sure that the role is a good fit and, you know, talk about the in- intricacies about of that. Um, and then they have to go through, it's called the UBL. So the UBL is not a personality assessment. Yeah. Um, it's not a psychometric assessment. It's really an assessment of understanding people's willingness to succeed. Like the ultimate, like high performing, like what are the metrics that it takes to, for someone to be a top high, high achiever realistically. And, you know, there's, it's, again, it's not a personality thing because people of all different types of personalities can be successful. Sure. That's got nothing to do with it, right? It comes down to a couple of things that we've we've even talked about today and a huge one is mindset, yeah? If you have the sort of mindset where you can just get through things and you j- can just be positive and you can have that growth mindset, like you are just inherently going to do better in life than someone who just can't, yeah. you know? You, and we all know that there's – and that's okay, you know, that there's people that are, you know, they're struggling they just simply can't see any positive really in anything – that's not going to be a fit for what we do, you know. So that's the sort of stuff I've got to see if, it, if that's showing up. Um, and look, granted, like if, there, if there's certain things that are showing up when they do that that we feel like we can work on and, you know, it's more of a skill thing and, and we want to really help them but the will's there, then cool. Yeah, that's potentially something that we'll work through. Um, and then obviously you go through the reference checks and everything like that that you would normally go through. But, yeah, a little bit of the ringer. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, you do like we're not just spend time together as a business, but when you're living together as well, which we were like. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I love it. Sounds so blasé and a bit not even unprofessional. But when you say the word vibe, like, well, I, I understand that. But I, there's probably a lot of people that probably think that's a bit. Like, I don't. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like. 
typically a job interview is you sit down and you go through the, the prerequisites of what typically a job interview would look like. But you, you know what happens in that? You can fake that. 100%. Yeah. You can make all that shit up. Yeah. You really can. But and then if I put you in front of like four of my staff and you just got to have a coffee and have a conversation, that's a completely different thing. Yeah. And you get a real sense of who they are and how they spend their weekends and who they hang out with and, you know, like, and, and again, there's not, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, is this going to be a fit? And certain, for certain types, it's just not going to be. You get and a feeling. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. But I think what's lucky or where I feel lucky, I have not put an ad out to advertise for a job. Not since oh, I've started. Right. No. So everyone who's, who's works with me has found us. So like our, our most recent couple of hires, like the most, sorry, the, the next one that's coming on, I, I spoke at an event recently. She was there. She came up to me and she pretty much said, Morgan, like whenever you're ready, like I'm, I'm there. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. That is actually really cool. Yeah. And that's been kind of my thing, you know, like Kathy, who's my right hand woman, she was the manager of a cafe that I went to and she was amazing. You know, she was the sort of person that knew everyone and everyone loved her and it co- not only coffee was great, but you know, she just had that personality that you were magnetized by. And I didn't care that she didn't have any finance experience. I could teach that. Mm. But the rest of it, you can't teach. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm sure you can vouch for this too, but it's it's the same and we both worked in sales. And uh, that's the feedback, not blowing my own trumpet, but being just a good people's person. Correct. It's not a skill that's typically you can go to uni and just learn. You typically cannot. it's from your parents. <clears throat> like that's, I know, how we both – were able to attain that skill was from um, seeing someone else do it, seeing it all the time, um, and then you just like but simple things, right? Just simple things being taught as a kid to say please and thank you, right? Yeah. Like something like that, all of a sudden you start having conversations with adults as a kid. If you're doing that, typically you you begin to just be it, not ahead, but. No, but you start to influence people. You start to have influencing conversations. People start to listen to you. People want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most people, like most skills can be taught, most skills, but attitude, like I know a lot of people, very successful businesses that I know, and the head, the, the head of those businesses always say, I purely hire an attitude. Bingo. Because like some people have different, you know, um, different parts of that attitude and more important to them. But some people say, look, I just want someone that will say, I'll work it out. Like I'll take the initiative to work it out. Some people want, yeah. So yeah, that's typically that's what, what, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I want to know, way. cause you're, you're a big thinker for your clients too. And you said at the start of the podcast that you see their potential as well as what's currently in front of them. But for yourself, big picture thinking, where do you see it in the next three to five years with Penny Finance? And what are your goals if you're willing to share? Look at that smile. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I would love to, but I'm keeping that under wraps a little bit. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any, te- <laughs> any teasers? Oh, we're, we're growing. Yeah. We're growing. We, we are very much trying to attract the top talent. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we want to grow our broken network. That's going to mean we have to grow our back end as well, um, as in back end processing and admin staff. And, and we are we are absolutely growing. But there's a few things that are in the pipeline. Um, but until they happen, smart. Keep Very smart. Very <laughs> smart. Going back to the house thing a little bit, really, really basic, but I think it's a good way to finish, which is trying to maybe give some of our listeners just some basic tips, some basic education. The whole, a lot of t- today's been you know, some good words of wisdom and gems that will help them. But like what is um, in terms of when you want to buy a house, right? You, someone has like oh, I think of a lot of people that I know, a good stable job, um, them and their partner, they both have really good jobs. They've, they've been saving really, really hard. Is the process simply reaching out to a broker? Yeah, man. That's yeah. it. Slide into the DMs. Because I think, <laughs> and this is my mindset around it, is – Growing up, and I don't know about you, mate, but our, our parents owned their houses. I saw my parents sell a house, get another house. I never, there was never a broker. No, they used the bank, right? So mm. I'd love to hear more about that in terms of why, why, why didn't we hear about that? Like, mm. why, why is, and I think that's partly like why. Yeah, we have no idea. No. Nah. No idea. Yeah, no, look. Mortgage broking has become a lot more popular in more recent times. Like I started broking in 2016, I'm pretty sure, which is like right around Royal Commission time. So Mm -hmm. like it was a pretty hectic time to start. But 
I didn't really notice it all that much because I didn't have any previous experience. So a lot of the brokers who were broking at that point and had been brokers a really long time started finding it really hard because a lot of compliance came in and everything like that. So I think, you know, and I, again, I don't know all that much. I haven't really done necessarily that much research, but I think what happened was previously brokers had a pretty bad name. Yeah. Because they, I don't know, maybe it was to do with commissions and things yeah. like that and things not really being disclosed all that well and people not really understanding it. And and then once sort of all of that compliance stuff sort of really started to come in, now it's just, it's so transparent. Like we are legally obligated to act in your best interest. We have literally what's called best interest duty. So as a mortgage broker, you come into me, I have legally no choice but to make sure that you get the absolute best option for you and whatever that means for your situation. Whereas previously... We just had to prove that it wasn't unsuitable. Right. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, there was, it was a little bit. And so I think that that probably had a bit to do with it. There was just this kind of negative connotation around it. And, and for whatever reason, people trust banks, <laughs> which is it, like the irony and that's pretty hilarious. Mm. But so there is the generation of people who will just feel very loyal to their bank and then if that then has permeated down to to their kids like take CBA as an example the dollar mart account that you had mm. when you were a kid and like that marketing that you've essentially been fed to you since yeah, you were true. like great you recruitment know, process it, correct <laughs> yeah. 100% but it is genius like it oh, works yeah. perfectly whereas what I like it's a pretty easy sell for me right I have access to all of the banks Okay, so you get to come to me. We get to figure out exactly what's going to be the right move for you. I do all of the legwork. I take you through the entire process. I get it approved. You get to buy a house. The alternative to that is you walk into ANZ, let's just say, and hypothetically your situation isn't a fit for ANZ. So ANZ says no to you and then you just think, well, fuck, I can't get a house. Like I can't yeah. do it. Like this is a no. But it just meant I, I – how do you come to me and I know your circumstance? I wouldn't have taken you to ANZ because yeah. it wouldn't have been a fit. Obviously, I'm just using that as, a, as an example. Yeah. But we do all the legwork to make sure that you get plugged in where it's right rather than you potentially screwing it up, yeah, because yeah. all of those hits on your credit file, that's all going to make a difference. The time it takes to go through that process too. Not only that, ironically, the banks aren't legally obligated to act in your best interest. Right. Yeah, because you walk into a bank, they're just going to try and fit you into one of their products regardless if it's the right one in the market for you. It's kind of scary, to be honest. I actually were well, giving you a stalk on your profile and <laughs> you, did, you did a really good video and it was about that. It was like you walk into a bank and the energy is just, you know, no, no offence to bankers listening, <laughs> but uh, I'm not saying this is you, but... but, <laughs> but it, we did but, have one spot to the show for a while. Yeah, oh, <laughs> shit. Um, but... I think, yeah, the real was the, I can't remember what song or, you know. I know the one you but it, But it was, it was it just, it made me go, shit, like if that's, I'm not in a position right now to buy a house. But when I am, I'm like, I'm going to a broker. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to a bank because you want it to be a, an exciting process. Exactly. And, and like, hearing her, it makes it sound so easy, doesn't it? Oh, certainly. Yeah, Morgan makes it sound yeah, Morgan's already told me. So <laughs> just on that, um, that legwork that Morgan was talking about earlier about, uh, you know, capturing the young people when they're not in the position to. So when they are, there's only one person. Morgan's, that's, her magic is already uh, swept for me, Morgan. So you've already got a client in the, in the future. So we look forward to that. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> but how do people, of course, find you um, and go and see these amazing social media profiles that we've been talking about today? Yeah, well, I do hang out mostly on Insta. Mm. So that is a great place. So start there. Have a look and, you know, do the vibe check on us, you know, I would hope that we are the right fit for you, but there is also lots of brokers out there. I would suggest seeing a broker over a bank, like well and truly. Um, but yeah, start there, you know, have send a message in the DMs. I will often when I post, you know, either on stories or um, mostly on stories, I'll usually link it there. And we, we usually start with a discovery call. Like that's usually the best place to start because that's going to give me about 15, 20 minutes to have a chat to you. We're going to get to know one another, going to understand where you're at, where you're trying to get to, and I'll just let you know how I can help. And then from there, if we're ready essentially to move into a strategy session and getting you pre-approved, then that's what we'll do. If we work out that, you know, it is you are more aligned to like a purchase plan or something, then I'll obviously direct you that way. So that's the best place to start. But yeah, cool. jump on. Most what I what I tend to have is people be like, Oh, I've been, you know, following on for a while and you know, whatever it was that I posted was that one thing that was yeah. like Fuck, that resonated with me and you know, here I am and I'm I'm ready to go. So that's my other thing. Like that's why I keep trying to be as consistent as possible and I keep trying to put out as much as I can because it, you know, they might have been following for the last two years, but for whatever reason, 
it's only now in this moment yeah. that they finally feel ready. Well, didn't you say the other day you said, I think you got a message and it was literally, this is this is my name, this is what I'm earning, yeah. this is where I want to live. That's con- Yeah, I like, just want to brag. Like that that's amazing. Like that's proof to anyone out there that's thinking about it. Like the trust is there already. Through an Instagram DM. That's, that's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, God. Well, I've loved today. It's actually been really, really like educational. Like for me, I know that and I don't know about you, but um, the idea of buying a house has always been um, not scary but just confusing. You know, and I, I feel like even off the back of today, I'm like, it's actually not as confusing as I thought. Oh, I'm so glad. Clarity, yeah. yeah. So thank you for um, thank you for taking the time and, and having us here. And thank you to Ben for having us here. And Ben and his bulging biceps has <laughs> been in my eye line the whole thank time. Thank God you said biceps. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you have no idea how happy that's going to make you. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. God. But, uh, but yeah, everyone go and follow uh, Penny Finance. It's at, at Penny Finance yep. at, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and do you have a website as well? Yeah, pennyfinance.com.au. The website, um, look, the website was one of those things I created when we first started the business. So it, it definitely needs an evolution. But um, where the website's great is obviously that's where you can go and, and click through to be able to book a call. But honestly, if if you are listening to this and you are following me, then you can just send us a message and we'll, we can direct you from there. So Love no it. Fantastic. stress. Well, thank you too for sharing your story as well because I know that some of it's not easy to talk about. So I really appreciate that. That was Nice to hear your backstory too. So, yeah, I've loved it too. And thank you, Morgan, and appreciate it. You're welcome, friends.